If any of these topics are very sensitive to you or just feel sensitive today, please feel free to click off and do something that feels good for you today. And I hope to see you in another video. Hello everyone and welcome back to A Whole World of Love. I am Era of Love and I'm very happy to bring you another video today. Before you finish watching this video today, be sure to hit subscribe as well as hit the notification bell below because I have so much good content coming your way, including new music that you won't want to miss. Today's video, we will be taking a trip Back in history. So be sure to grab your fancy hats, your pearls, your suspenders, whatever you need for this journey into the 40s and 50s and some crazy stuff happening in 1939. <laughs> we are going to be talking about the story of Billie Holiday and her life, her political ideas and societal beliefs and the ways in which her hardships influenced her view of the world. I am very excited to have a special guest with me today to share his side of the story in recalling all the way back to the era of the 40s and 50s when my grandpa was alive to see Billie Holiday play and remember what the world was like back then in the time when Billy was making waves in the music industry and in the systemic structures of our country. Hi, Grandpa. Right. <laughs> How are you? Okay. So you know why we're here today. We're going to talk about Billy Holiday. I'm so happy. Thank you for, for joining me. <laughs> so you will see clips of my grandpa sprinkled in sharing his memories of which I'm so grateful for him to share with me, but also to be able to share with all of us here today. So my research into Billie Holiday began in an interesting way. I was watching Judas and the Black Messiah, which... If you haven't seen it, it is honestly, I think, the best film of the year. I definitely highly recommend watching it. And through hearing Fred Hampton's story and watching that film that I felt did such an amazing job at humanizing him and his revolutionary participation in community, I started to think about Strange Fruit and how it had an impact and when it had an impact. I don't think I knew when it had come out at the time. I just wanted to know more about it. So I went to my record stack and grabbed this giant vinyl of Billie Holiday that I collected from a local jazz fest a couple years back. I was pretty certain that this was a comprehensive collection of Billie songs, as it's called Billie Holiday, The Golden Years, and... Um, there's three LPs, so it's like 30 songs. So I figured there was absolutely no way that her number one song ever, named Song of the Century by Time Magazine, Strange Fruit, could not be included. That night, do you remember her playing Strange Fruit and the crowd reaction? Like, were people. Oh, yeah, she got a standing ovation, you know? Oh. Then Coleman Hawkins came on with a tenor sax. Body and Soul was his big number. You know, but she was the big thing that night, the big draw, the big draw that night, you know. So I dug a little bit deeper into the liner notes of this vinyl and found the foreword written by Billy's own producer, John Hammond. Now, to start out, John began his paragraph with a microaggression towards Billy, saying that she was slightly overweight when he met her. Which I just honestly found rude. And was surprised that her producer would 
start off by saying that. But the paragraph that really struck me and sent me into a spiral of research learning about Billy and her story was this one. John Hammond said, It is one of the tragedies of the music business that Billy had neither the wisdom nor the strength to make the most of her opportunities. And I must confess that my own interest in Billy waned as her fame grew. The more conscious she was of her style, the more mannered she became. And I suppose that artistically, the worst thing that ever happened to her was the overwhelming success of her singing the Lewis Allen poem, Strange Fruit, which amassed a host of fans with the intelligentsia and the left. I found this to be strange because John Hammond seemed to contradict himself, saying that this was the best time for her career and she was boosting her influx of fans, but that he felt this was the worst thing that ever happened for her career. And if he means it in a capitalistic sense, if she wasn't able to capitalize on her music as much by continuing to silently play the game and come out with love songs while people were publicly lynched, well, maybe he's right. Maybe she lost that one. But to me and to so many others who remember her as a hero and remember her for her political ideas, her spirit, her... The way that she took her experience and turned it into compassion. I mean, you, you just can't put a price tag on that. So, I honestly didn't feel like I connected very much with John Hammond, not that that mattered. <laughs> but he definitely started off my research with his strange comments and the choice to omit the song Strange Fruit from this collection. Wanting to dig deeper and read Billy's story from her own words and from her own pen, I discovered that she had an autobiography and was really excited. I had read jazz musicians' autobiographies in the past, like Anita O'Day, one of my favorite singers, and Anita's story shared similarities, so I was excited to start reading Billy's story. I actually found it for free on a website that's linked below, so you can either listen to it or you can read it for free um, in the archive link. So this book is highly disputed, and even on Amazon today, you can't buy Billie Holiday's own autobiography, but you can buy multiple different books saying that they are debunking, setting the record straight, straightening out the story of Billy's own story. And all of these counter stories seem to have something in common, which is that they feel the need to fixate on small details such as locations, specific dates, maiden names, and things like this to invalidate Billy's stories, some of them even calling her a liar, and otherwise defaming her own story. Amazon does not sell Billie Holiday's autobiography, but they sell two different stories with like a very similar title and very similar picture on the cover, but they're written by white men. And if you read the description, it says like debunking Billie Holiday's autobiography and all the discrepancies in her story. So like, what do you think about that? Because that's kind of crazy, right? <laughs> Marty. Yeah. You know, because a lot of them will put in stuff that probably wasn't true, you know. I found this pretty alarming, honestly, because historically speaking, black women were barred or black girls, you can say, were barred from education. And those who were able to receive education, so in Billy's time, she was able to attend school, but because her family needed support and all the support they could get, Billy had to leave school at a very young age and wasn't able to finish learning how to read and write enough to pen her own story. 
She also wrote the book at a time where she was desperately in need of money to pay for legal fees, along with just the cost of living in New York. So this could have been another contributing factor to why she decided to work with a biographer and speed up the process. So I'm not necessarily sure that she wasn't comfortable penning her own story by herself, but this definitely saved a lot of time. So that's another speculation of why she may have chosen to work with William Dufty. So she decided to work with a close friend, William Dufty, who some have even said Billy didn't enjoy working with, Billy didn't read the book and didn't work on it, and many other things that would just entirely invalidate her autobiography. But when I did a little bit of research into who he was and how their relationship was, I realized that Billy was the godmother of his... It was either his child or his, his wife's child. Billy was very close with William Dufty as well as his wife at the time. And his wife was one of Billy's absolute best friends. Again, she was the godmother of her child. So to say that they weren't close or to try to invalidate this story at all, I think I kind of just ask, you know, why? <laughs> why do that? Why take the closest thing that we have to Billy's story and try to debunk it? I just don't really see the point in that. So the other thing that I decided to do was listen to the cadencing of the story and relate it to an interview that I found with Billy Holiday. I understand, Billy, that you have uh, enlarged your scope of talents, not only to include fine singing, but you've also written a book called A Lady Sings the Blues. I understand, too, that it's a bestseller. Yes, I'm very happy about it. Uh, gee whiz, we tried to get it and out here in L.A., and it was all sold out in Chicago and New York, and they're making up some new ones. You mean you couldn't buy a copy of your own book? I never read it yet. <laughs> Every one I get, my friends take it away from me. I'll bet they take it away autographed, too. Did you uh, actually write the book, or did you hire a writer to write it for you? No, I, uh, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Dufty is his name, he's a co-editor for the Post in New York, Post newspaper, and, uh, well, to uh, make a long story short, my husband, one night we were talking, and people had been writing things about me and getting them all wrong and all screwed up. I won't mention the newspapers or the magazines, bless them. So my husband said, why don't you write a book and tell your side? So I uh, went to Bill, and he got the typewriter, and it took us about two, three months, and I just told him he wrote. That's how the book came about. I am not an investigative journalist, but I will say that the diction and the cadencing in her sentence structure felt very similar to the flow of the book, and I am choosing in this video to honor her story that she told with William Dufty as the closest possible thing I can get to her own pen. Throughout the book, Billy characterizes her family, her mother especially, and her close relationship with her. Her mother was an extremely giving person and an entrepreneur, so she would always be starting businesses, restaurants, but she was so compassionate that it turned into basically her giving everyone food to eat and Billy being her only paying customer. Her mother was described as caring, loving, and also one of her closest friends. Billy shared that her mother was only 13 when she had her, so there wasn't a huge age gap, and I got the sense that they were more friends throughout many of the years of their lives than a mother-daughter relationship. They seemed to take care of one another, and I really liked hearing about their relationship. Like, human rights shouldn't be considered politics it should be simple right but at the same time 
it is politicized. So when Billy was speaking about lynchings in the United States, they, to them, to the government, that was political because racial oppression equals more power, right? Like if you can keep people separated and keep people afraid of one another and keep people- Oh yeah, they didn't like that song at all. They really didn't like that, you know? And that became, like I said to you, left-wing people loved it. Artists, intellectuals, bohemians, you know, anybody that way, you know? The other thing that really stood out in the book to me was Billy's political ideas. And these ideas seemed to develop, especially after she spent time in prison and experienced the wrath of the prison industrial complex firsthand. How did people feel about the government at that time? (laughs) Well, you got to remember that was just after the uh, McCarthy crap, you know? Um, He was a lunatic, an alcoholic, and uh, everybody was a communist, a communist, communist, you know? You had it like... uh, A lot of fear. What? A lot of fear, right? Oh, yeah. He, He, him and Hoover were two evil people. Hoover was another racist, big time. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, McCarthy, yeah, because if you were branded, a, all artists were more, more considered lefties, you know, so they were all communists. The nonsense. She noticed in discrepancies between her and other people who had similar status, but a different color skin. People like Judy Garland, who also had heroin addictions, but were sent to rehab and their addiction was treated as a health crisis rather than treated as a crime. The one thing that I read also in in Billy's autobiography was about, you know, she was talking about her drug use and how she was sent, sent to prison or sent to jail and targeted and she was like expressing expressing her confusion of like why can't i just go to a rehab like judy garland like why mm-hmm. is why is this happening so was there like a big divide between white and oh absolutely and walter winchell was another piece of shit who uh was a big columnist then and a good friend of uh joe mccarthy that's come back and oh. uh walter winchell made the fatal fatal mistake of Josephine Baker. You ever heard of Josephine Baker? She was the big entertainer who lived in Paris, France. She left the United States, but she came here for a visit in 51. And at the Stork Club, which was a famous club uh, restaurant in New York City, she went into, because she was famous, 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 and they wouldn't wait on her. And she knew Winchell and he totally ignored her didn't do anything and wrote some crap about her and all that. But he um, he shot himself in the foot and nobody wanted to go near him, you know? Yeah, he was another one. But they definitely, they were targeted because they were black. Right, so the media differently. And then they would also be treated differently if they had challenges with drugs. So not only was Billie Holiday more vulnerable to being criminalized because of the color of her skin, but also was targeted by the government because of her bravery in speaking out and using her platform, her artistic voice, and her art to take a stance against racial oppression in the form of lynchings in this country, in a way that not many others were brave enough to do so at the time. So when saw her she was already performing strange fruit so do you remember if she performed it that night yeah she said that was her her standard number and it says also that a lot of left wing and intellectuals loved her for that reason you know and artists for that song she was arrested for drugs and they couldn't get a cabaret card for a lot of years in those days they wouldn't let you play monk was the same way they took his card away so they couldn't play in Manhattan. None of them uh, really uh, blossomed out until the 50s, you know, and it was white and black together. Right. Yeah, especially like 
at, in Los Angeles, it was the same way. They wouldn't, even the, even the musicians union then in LA had a black union and a white union. Oh, which wow. Was, into, you know, it was crazy. I but didn't it was even mainly, Yeah, it was mainly the East Coast that had the musicians. The real good, the real, the real beboppers and her, she's just before like Dizzy and all them knew her. Well, Gillespie, even Miles, he was, you know, at 48, he knew her. 49 when he came up into New York City, you know. But she, uh, she was the big, she, they had, she had a cult following, big, pretty big cult following all the time. You know, she died young. The 50s really didn't, you know, like a lot of them, they, they ruined a lot of black, but yeah, the blacklist, a lot of writers, because they were that way, they went after them. As she was playing to mostly white folks in clubs, it was shocking to many people listening. But for people like my grandpa, they were happy to hear it and wanted to see more integration, wanted to see black people have rights and equity. And Billy pushed that along before the civil rights movement even emerged. In many ways, Strange Fruit is considered one of the absolute first protest songs of the civil rights movement and ushered in change, at least in thought in a way that allowed for revolutionaries to take the torch and make change in policy. Billie Holiday was a supporter of these policy changes, as read in her book. She talked about drug use being treated as a health crisis and health insurance being a huge issue in America. She felt that people deserve to have health care, equal health care, and that drug addiction shouldn't be treated as a crime, but as a health concern. This was extremely progressive thinking for the time. So in reading Lady Sings the Blues, I was able to really connect to Billie Holiday as the human being that she was and see and read not only her hardships and the horrible, really challenging things that she experienced and the ways that she coped with those challenges, but seeing how those experiences influenced Billie's empathy and her view of the world as well as systems in place and how she felt things could be improved to improve the quality of life of all people. Billy definitely stood for equity and racial justice and civil rights, but she also just had such a grounding in humanity and just an understanding in what it's like to be a human being experiencing challenge and pain and how the system plays a role in that. Many people have assigned Billie Holiday the responsibility of her actions over the years, but even Billie herself was able to find a balance in this. Billie took a great deal of responsibility in her life choices and experiences, but she also had such a grounded perspective in how the system played such a big role in laying the foundation of her experience and the ways that she suffered as well as coped. Her father, Clarence Holiday, was unable to receive the treatment he needed because of medical apartheid and racial bigotry within the medical system at the time, despite being a veteran and needing immediate emergency treatment. Because of this, Billy felt that he himself experienced a form of lynching and would think of him each time she sang the song Strange Fruit. Unfortunately, Billy herself even experienced similar things towards the end of her life, but we'll talk about that more in episode three. And I encourage you to read the resources below, but especially to read Billy's autobiography, Lady Sings the Blues. Like I said, there's a free resource below where you can check it out. It's, I believe it's archive.org. And I think the hardest part about telling this story is this. 
So many people have tried to tell Billy's story again, correct the record, and seemingly just try to be right about Billy's story. And I want to make something really clear. I don't want to be right about Billy's story. I want to know Billy's story, and I want to hear it from her voice. But unfortunately, because of the way things played out, the closest thing we have to Billy's story is her autobiography, and I'm happy and I feel blessed that I was able to read that. But I find it extremely important that we recognize the flaw in not being able to trust Billy's own story and having to look for these loopholes and try to invalidate her story when the quality in Lady Sings the Blues in both the characters as well as just the personal character development of Billy's own story from her perspective is rich and valuable and shows these more detailed sides of Billy's thought process and growth that we would definitely not be able to see without having this book. In episode two of this series, we will be talking about how Billy's story can influence our activism in the present day and what we can do to respect Black femme voices and stories today for those who can tell their story and the importance of listening to Black femme artists and their experiences so that we can make changes to our system. Unfortunately, some that still need to be changed, though Billy was talking about them 65 years ago. I'd like the main takeaway for today's video to be, let's build our awareness of how Black femme stories are historically erased and convoluted. Be aware of this as we're seeking information about historical icons that we value and love and respect and try to get to the bottom of getting as close to the story told from their voice as we possibly can, but also seeing the innate blind spot in searching for these stories, which is you know, the challenge of people needing to hire biographers and this general inclination for people to erase or correct the record of black femme voices and people and their stories. Although we can't get to the absolute bottom of this, and I wish we could talk to Billy herself today, we can do our very best to listen to the closest sources we have and, you know, respect her story. She truly was a progressive icon and made waves that I believe influenced the civil rights movement and so many positive changes in our society. And I hope to celebrate her in this series as well as ground into the present of the ways we're still pushing to improve our world. So thank you, Billy, for telling your story through your music as well as your words. And I'll see you all in episode two. I hope you have a beautiful day. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below. I love you all and I'll see you next time.